Welcome to Mount Ararat Podcast. I'm Adam Lavelle from WrestlingDoneRight.com. I'm also known as the Wrestling Snob. Some people call me the old man wrestling fan, and I have attempted to create, to start the IIWC. That's the Intelligent Internet Wrestling Community. And I'm going to label anybody who likes pro wrestling Noah a member of that community because let me tell you, Noah is the thinking man's professional wrestling. That's my opinion, and I'm full of them, but I'm here to talk about the N1 show uh, pro wrestling uh, tournament that that, uh, Noah has every single year. If you're familiar with the G1 out of Noah, if you're familiar with the Five Star Grand Prix out of World Wonder Ring Stardom, this is Noah's version of it, and it kicked off on August 4th. Yes, I'm behind. I am behind for sure. I'm going to do my best to catch up as quickly as possible, but I can't guarantee you I'm going to be caught up by the time the finale airs live, but we'll see what I can do. Let's get into this right away because my goal is to not make real super long videos here uh, for your enjoyment. And I hope you do enjoy this because Noah is very underrepresented out there in the world of podcasts and um, pages and, and what have you, right? I'm turning down my volume uh, so we don't hear the messages I get on Facebook as I begin. Now let's get into this. The show kicked off on August 4th with Alpha Wolf taking on El Hegel del Dr. Wagner Jr. Now I'm going to admit I have missed Dr. Wagner Jr.'s reign as the GHC heavyweight champion. I was away trying to get a bigger audience. Long story, but I have other videos and I have a post on Reddit and my Facebook group page, Pro Wrestling Noah Saves the Wrestling World. Check that out if you want to see more details. This match was terrific. This match could have been and easily probably should have been the main event here, although I liked absolutely everything about this entire show. A little bit of a spoiler. Alpha Wolf and Dr. Wagner Jr. went full bore Lucha Libre here. Now, both of them are big guys, so you're not going to see Rey Mysterio Jr. type of Lucha Libre here. You're going to see the larger heavyweight style of it, which is a little bit more physical, which is why I like Lucha Libre in pro wrestling, Noah, better than I like it anywhere else, because it's more, I don't know if I want to say toned down or what, but it's a, a higher flying style, a riskier style combined with power moves and men, you know, stalking each other as they try to find their inroads and wearing one another down. And it was Alpha Wolf who wore down the former GHC heavyweight champion for a major win here. Some would call this a shocker. Some would call this an upset. But look, Alpha Wolf has been ready to break out in a major way. I love his team with his brother, Dragon Bane. But here... Both of them are competing against each other to see who can make it, if not both of them can make it to the top of this tournament and maybe face each other. Wouldn't that be something? But this was an excellent match. I don't really like to give star ratings or what have you. A match is either good or it's not. This was beyond good. I'd say this was excellent. Absolutely wrestling done right. And again, big, huge win for Alpha Wolf. Right after that, was his brother's match, Dragon Bane versus Asushi Katogi. Katogi is in this tournament because Go Shiozaki got injured and had to be replaced. And that's unfortunate because Shiozaki is a major part of Noah. He has been for a long time. And for him to be out is pretty disappointing and sad. Certainly not his fault. I mean, he's injured and, and he works a hard style. So I'm not shocked that he's injured. I appreciate his work, but here we got Katogi coming in, and he gave an excellent battle to Dragon Bane, which, of course, instantly insinuates what the the outcome here was. Yeah, Katogi goes down to Bane, but let me tell you something. I think this is one of my favorite Katogi matches, and I've been watching Noah since about 2016, 2017. And I just thought this this kid wrestled inspired. I guess he's not really a kid anymore. Kind of looks like one. Still looks pretty young. Um, But Dragon Bane, again, along with his brother Alpha Wolf, they are incredibly inspired here. They want to reach the top of this tournament. They want to show what they're all about. And he showed what he was all about here. At one point, he even caught Katogi in some kind of submission move where he had him sitting on his knees. Like It's hard to explain. You'll see in the screen captures that go by here. It, It was just... I'm not saying it was like awe-inspiring or incredible, but it was a different looking move. Like um, Dragon Bane was down on, on in his hunches and had Katogi down like in some kind of almost dragon sleeper type of move. 
but Katogi's knees were resting on Dragon Bane's knees. It, it was interesting. It was unique. It was different. That isn't what got the victory for Dragon Bane, but this was another very solid match. Um, I don't see how anybody would say, was it as good as Alpha Wolf versus Wagner Jr.? I don't know. I think it was as good in a different way. It was a different style. It was a little bit more high-flying. It was definitely a little bit more fast-paced, although what I love about Noah is that nothing is so fast-paced that it looks like it's on fast-forward. I mean, we see that in wrestling today. I know that's pretty much what modern-day wrestling is, but Noah... I appreciate and love them, absolutely love them, for slowing the pace of their matches down and using more psychology, in my opinion. And there was a lot of psychology here that saw Katogi contend and come close very many times, and Katogi refusing to be put away. I mean, this this guy kicked out of more moves than I could count. If there was a criticism of this match, it was that, that Katogi looked like he was completely unbeatable until the very end when Dragon Bane wins it and gets the two points. Next was Titus Alexander versus Tavian Heights. I don't know Titus Alexander from Adam. <laughs> you know, I don't know this guy. And that's not that's not an insult. I, I've got to look him up. I've got to know where he's from. And I should do those kind of things before I do the podcast, right? But I did not. But this kid looked great. But man, did I become a huge fan of Tavian Heights here. Apparently, he's in NXT uh, with um, William Regal's son and that little group that I forget, Catch Something, uh, Drew Gulak. I'm a big Drew Gulak fan. I hated what happened to him in WWE. Screw you, Ronda Rousey. Um, but Tavian Heights, in a losing effort here, I was shocked that he lost. The, the ending was kind of, I don't want to say it was botched, but it looked like Alexander was supposed to get him in a German suplex that he held onto into a bridge or something, or maybe roll him and give him a second one. Something messed up at the end of this. I, I have to say it was somewhat of a botch, uh, but not terrible. After the big German suplex, Alexander pretty much just let him go, rolled over, and, and covered him for the pin. It was a disappointing ending to an incredible match. Both these guys are something else. Um, nothing against Titus Alexander. I'm definitely a fan of his, and I definitely want to look more into him. But I don't know what it is about Tavian Heights that blew my mind, even though he lost. He's a former Olympian, looks good, wrestles good. I love that style of wrestling, that that strong amateur style, if you will. Uh, converted into professional wrestling is my favorite. Timothy Thatcher, right? Um, William Regal and his son, whose name I always forget because I don't watch NXT. Um, but I loved this match. I really liked both wrestlers, but man, Tavian Heights has quickly become a favorite of mine. And I don't watch NXT, so I didn't really have anything to base it on. Someone uh, had to tell me he was in New Catch something. I'm not going to remember the name, but it doesn't matter. I don't watch NXT, but wow. This was a gr another solid, fun, enjoyable, my style of match that... Um, Titus Alexander wins, then congrats to him. I've got to look more into him. For him to beat a guy like Tavian Heights, that's meaningful to me, for sure. Then we had another NXT uh, superstar, if you will, coming in from WWE, Josh Briggs, who's huge. This guy, I think Mark Pickering said he was uh, seven foot five or something like that. I'm not seven, six foot seven, seven foot five. Yeah, he's elegante. Uh, <laughs> Josh Briggs is like six foot seven. Because I knew Stu Fulton said he's like the only wrestler in Noah that he has to actually look up to. And Stu Fulton is like six foot five. Stu Fulton and Mark Pickering are the English commentators for Noah who do a great job. Two of the best commentators in wrestling. Really, especially for Noah. They really put Noah over as being legit because that's how Noah still tries to present himself in this day and age. Which makes me love them even more. I want wrestling to be presented as legitimate. I don't care that everybody knows about kayfabe and this other nonsense. I don't care. Give it to me real, baby. Give it to me for real. Um, but Titus Alexander, uh, that was the last match. Josh Briggs versus, I'm going to butcher this, um, Rohi, Iowa. It's not the state of Iowa, but it's R-Y-O-H-E-I First, first name, last name, O-I-W-A. Uh, thanks, Asami, for, in the past, helping me learn and pronounce these names. Haven't talked to Hisami in some time. Still follow her. She's the best when it comes to covering Noah. I'm sorry. There's nobody better than her. Nobody. She is so knowledgeable. Um, I, as always, I will link to her page in the comments section, in the description section of this video. But um, 
Josh Briggs is gigantic. He came across like a Gaijin monster, and I love that. You know, I'm not saying he's Bruiser Brody or anything like that, but no one knows how to use these big Gaijins to come in and just wreak havoc everywhere they go. And Iowa is the next big deal, and no one likely a future ace of the company. He's also quite large, stood toe to toe with Briggs. He's not six foot seven, but he didn't look little, and he wrestled his heart out. But this was probably Josh Briggs' best match. I mean, I didn't watch NXT, but I can't imagine he wrestled a match better than this. I've never heard of him, so he clearly wasn't like some big winner in that company. I'm sure old Triple H is sending these guys to Noah to get a hell of a lot better. And if they wrestle matches like this, that's going to happen. And WWE is going to get a gift when they come back to that company. They're going to get a uh, guy who was trained in the best wrestling company in the world that hopefully can transfer that because him beating Iowa here was special. You, you know it was. I don't know how he's going to do in the rest of the tournament. Some have all, matches have already happened, of course. I'm way behind, but I can't wait to see how Briggs does and how Iowa rebounds from this. Another solid match that I very much enjoyed. Next up, we had an eight-man tag team. Of course, this is not part of the tournament, but they're going to throw these in here so guys can get on the show and we can get a break from the singles matches here or there. Uh, Hajime Ohara, Junta Miyawaki, Kai Fujimura, and Shuhei Taniguchi took on Eita, Naomuchi Marafuji, Ninja Mac, my buddy Ninja Mac, and Takashi Sugura. Ninja Mac always shared my videos back when I've had about five or six months away from Noah, which I regret and will never do again. But when I was at my height, putting out podcasts on every single show. Ninja Mac always shared them. Other people on the roster did too, but Ninja Mac every single time. I hear he's leaving Noah or has left by now. He's going to be greatly missed. This match was good for what it was. You're going to find out I'm not a big fan of multi-man matches. So you're going to say, but you like Japanese wrestling? <laughs> I know. Other than tournaments like this and special big pay-per-view quality type shows, a lot of all of Puresso, Japanese wrestling, is multi-man matches. Um, I watch them. I don't hate them, but I just, I wish we got a lot more singles and tags. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel. That's not going to make me hate this and give it a bad rating, if you will. But it's just a lot. You know, eight guys plus a referee is nine people in the ring for the 11 minutes of this match, which isn't a long time, but still, it's a lot. Um, the best part about this was the ending. I mean, we're just going to jump right to the ending when Taniguchi pinned Marafuji. Marafuji won half of the tag team champions, the heavyweight tag team champions with Takashi Zagura, two legends, absolute two legends. And Taniguchi just lost his mind. He was so excited. I mean, he choke slammed Zagura after he pinned Marafuji. He's just super excited and not just for the win. He's excited because he knows he has a partner that is going to help him pursue those heavyweight tag team champions, the championship. And he's going to introduce him here momentarily. And let me tell you, it's great stuff. Taniguchi introduces his partner and it's none other than Suji Ishikawa, a legend in Japanese wrestling in Puresso. All Japan champion, you know, the Triple Crown champion, uh, multi-time All Japan tag team champion. I mean, this guy is legit as they come. He's huge. He's got to be uh, Briggs' size, six foot seven, at least I would guess, maybe taller. And Taniguchi is excited to have him as a partner because they are going to challenge the heavyweight tag team champions uh, for sure. That that being. Um, <laughs> Marafuji and Segura. Sorry, I'm all over the place. I'm excited, guys. I am worked up and excited to be back here. I've got notes. I've got two screens in front of me, notes on both pages. So as my eyes dart back and forth, bear with me. I think a lot of you who do listen, uh, probably listen, just listen and don't watch the video, which is perfectly fine. Uh, a lot of people tell me they, they like that they can just turn on my podcast on YouTube and listen as they're driving or as they're you know working or what have you. Uh, but for those of you who watch, just understand this is my first day back 
to Pro Wrestling No Amount Error at Podcast after five to six months off. But the ending of this was super and sets up a huge tag team matchup that I can't wait for. We get back to the N1 tournament after this as Oka Sasaki takes on Yoshiki Inamura. Um, I know Oka Sasaki. I, while I've been away from Noah for five or six months, still followed them, still paid attention. I wanted to know what was going on. And Oka Sasaki stepped straight out of the UFC, a skilled MMA fighter. I love when MMA fighters come over to pro wrestling because they know how to make shit look real, right? And I've always been a big fan of Inamura. I don't know what happens to him that he hasn't had greater success in Noah. But then we got someone like Masa Kitamiya, who seems to have taken forever to finally get to the top or around the top of no. I mean, he had moments, peak moments, like the cage match um, with Nakajima. But too many times I've watched, and we're not here to talk yet about him, but he has had some, uh, Masa Kitamiya has had some incredible moments, but then he'd have a bunch of losses that confused me. And that sort of seems to be where Yoshiki Inamura here, he goes down here to a rear naked choke, taps out, or he'd have been put to sleep for sure. Oka Sasaki, much smaller than Inamura, and as uh, Stu and Mark pointed out on commentary, which I love, it's going to take him a while to get used to wrestling out of a weight class, right? In MMA, UFC, he's in a weight class. Here, he's wrestling Inamura, who's so much larger. Uh, Inamura's problem, and again, Mark Pickering, I think, pointed this out, is that he relies 100% on his brute strength. Okay, and of course, if you're as big as him, you're going to rely a lot on it, but he has to learn from what we see in the results of his matches that he has to rely on other things, other skills, because Sasaki used many skills. He knew he wasn't stronger, so he used his, uh, excuse me, his technique, his ability, his, his um, skills, his, his MMA skills to take down the giant, the much bigger man, a giant compared to Sasaki, to win this match at around the 11 minute mark. Again, another match I really enjoyed, guys. There's been nothing on here that I haven't absolutely loved. I, this, these matches, there's been no run-ins. There's been no interferences, which is all you see everywhere else, especially in the two big American companies, right? Run-ins and interference nonstop. And I'm okay with that once in a while from heels because that's what heels do. But sometimes it's ridiculous. I'd say often it's ridiculous. And if you get tired of those type of things, Pro Wrestling Noah is absolutely for you. The next matchup was another eight man. We're going to insert another eight man here to, I don't want to say slow things down, but you know, to, to just give us a rest from the singles and one tournament. You know, I don't want to say a bathroom break because everything Noah does is great. Including this, as we saw Amaska, the GHC junior heavyweight champion. This guy has, has grown leaps and bounds since last I watched Noah regularly. He was always good, but he has taken control of the junior division. He has a unique look. I don't love the look, but who cares? Look, you know, how a man looks doesn't matter in the least to me, but I'm throwing it out there. This is a unique and different look, uh, but makes him stand out. He teamed with Hayata, Tarasuke, and Yohei. Man, I miss good-looking guys. Jake Lee bolted for New Japan, and what they're going to do with, with that faction now, I don't know. I'm not really worried about it, but that was a cool faction. I liked it. It worked. But um, here, the, that team took on Stinger, which right now is only Daga and Yoshinara Agua. Something to say about Agua here momentarily. Super Crazy and Yu Awada. Again, good match. Nothing that, that blew me away or made me super excited, but it was a solid match. And again, it all came down to the end. The ending of this, after the match ended, Amaska, Hiata, Tarasuke, and Yohei defeated Daga, Agua, Super Crazy, and Awada. But after that was over, Hiata, on the winning side, was acting strange. He wasn't shaking hands with Amaska or Tadasuke or Yohei. He didn't turn on them. Do you ever see that? Of course you've seen this happen. You're watching a match. A guy wrestles in a team and in the end turns on them and beats somebody up and gives the other team the win, right? And you find yourself often scratching your head like, why would this guy take a beating all match long from this other team and then join them? Just a fake, you know, I'm going to willingly go in there and fight these guys and get hit, kicked, and punched by them. But when it's all over, take their side. That's not what happened here. The match ended. Hayata was on the winning side. Then shook hands with Daga, Agua, Super Crazy, and Iwata. Turned. 
it wasn't a violent extreme turn. It, the, his, his team of Amaska, Taraske, and Yohei pretty much scratching their heads like, what the hell? Yeah, he just, they had to just makes the decision. My team won, but screw those clowns. I'm, I'm going back to Stinger. Now, is Stinger going to still exist? That's the question we have, because it has been announced that Agua has retired suddenly and out of nowhere about six days ago, a little less than a week ago. And there's no retirement match. There's no retirement ceremony. That was Agua's wishes. He's just done. He's just retired. He's just So the leader of Stinger is gone. I mean, is he still working behind the scenes? I hope, because he's a tremendous trainer. But Haisami's reporting it's a neck injury. Um, it's bad from what I understand. Maybe one of those neck, neck injuries, if you take a bump, you know, you could be crippled. I don't know. I've got to read more of her stuff. I haven't had the time. I wanted to get this video out, guys. I didn't take a lot of notes. I just wanted to get my first Mount Ararat podcast out um, since it's been such a, a long time. But he's done. And he, I don't know if he can train. He can surely, hopefully, still consult in some way. I don't. We'll see what the word from Hisami is on that. What she finds out. She's my roving reporter, if you will. She's the best Noah reporter in the business, and um, I love her stuff. But um, what's going to happen to Stinger? Now it was Daga, Agawa, and Hayata, and now oh, Agawa's gone. Just Daga and Hayata. I mean, every time Stinger seems to build up, they lose members, they break up, they get back together. Stinger's the oldest faction, if you will, in Noah. I'd hate to see it die, but I don't think it's super crazy in. It sort of looked like super crazy was in at the end of this match is Awada. He's just the young guy they bring along to take the beating, it seems, but I don't know. We'll have to wait and see here. But again, the ending of this match with Hayata walking away from his team was very interesting and, and made the match worth it. You know, I watched the whole thing that told the story and he had to turns on his winning team. I don't know. I liked it. I thought both of these multi-man matches added something at the end that made watching them worth it. It's like, wow, oh, cool. That told a story leading to what happened here. Nice. Good job, Noah. We have two more matches in this tournament to talk about. Uh, we're back to the N1 victory tournament as Keno, one of my favorites, man. I have my, um, his old faction shirt. Congo hanging up right over here that I'll still wear here or there, even though that faction is gone. Loved it. Keno, the leader, former leader of, Ken of Congo, took on former Congo member and friend of his and tag team partner, Manabu Soya, who has changed his, he has blonde hair. He is cut like Lex Luger or something. Looks like a million bucks. I mean, I've always wanted Manabu Soya to be a bigger deal. He was the, in oh, Knock my microphone away. <laughs> he was the enforcer of Congo and took a lot of the beatings and sadly a lot of the pinfalls, but he's a big brute of a man. Um, he used to be in a company, I believe it was called Wrestle One, that Keiji Muto was the head of, if I remember correctly. Forgive me if I'm wrong there, but the name. Um, but uh, Soya looked amazing here. Uh, he's had one other match with Keno that was match of the year contender it was back in january of this year check that out check this one out this was just shy of 20 minutes with these two beating each other unmercifully both of them taking the best that each had to offer and continuing to go in amazing fashion yes there were a lot of kickouts at two false finishes if you will but it worked because these two are two of the toughest son of a bitches in all of wrestling and presenting them in such a way makes sense had me on the edge of my seat had me leaning in had me feeling like a giddy schoolboy or whatever i just loved this match i love these two they could be at the top of any company in the world in my opinion if you just want to see wrestling done right. And that's what this was. Keno overcomes with his double foot stomp off the top rope at the end. But Manabu Soya was almost impossible to stop. Keno was clearly frustrated. So was Soya. Because both of these men were just like two bull of the woods, that is. I like to say about two big guys that just tear into each other in a real looking fight. I um, loved it. Loved that this too could have easily been the main event. Keno wins, gets the two points, but Manabu Soya walks away looking like a monster, looking like a guy who has come leaps and bounds since the days of Congo. Great stuff here. Then the main, what was the main event of this N1 tournament? Of course, it was the GHC heavyweight champion, Kaito Kiyomiya, who I have struggled to like a lot. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like I dislike him. It's that 
in this company full of some of the bad, most biggest badasses in wrestling for this blonde haired, smiling, I don't want to call him Japanese Cody Rhodes because that's what Jim Cornette calls Okada. And it's an insult, even though I like Cody Rhodes. But for lack of a better description right now, it's weird. If Cody Rhodes came over and won the GHC Heavyweight Championship, is he worthy? Of course. Does it make sense on this roster? Not to me. Not to the guy who loves, you know, Keno and Manabu Soya and Timothy Thatcher and all these badasses, this company, Segura. I mean, watching this kid, this bushy-tailed, bright-eyed kid as a multi-time GHC champion sometimes bugs me a little, but I don't hate him. He is an incredible, amazing wrestler. I'm not even saying he doesn't deserve it. I'm just saying in my view of what is cool and badass and awesome, Kaitu Kiyomiya doesn't jump to the front of the line for me for that. He wrestled a guy from Dragon Gate I'm not familiar with at all, Luis Monte. This guy was good. He was like sort of a Mexican ricochet, if you will, um, doing leaps and jumps. Now, not like crazy. Not like crazy. Noah slows that shit down, too. You can come to Noah being a luchador. You can come to Noah being a high flyer and Ninja Mac, for example, and use all that stuff. But you're going to present your matches in a logical, psychological style. And that's what this was. Uh, Monte started the match with one of the biggest jumps I've ever ever seen off the running off the center of the top rope leaping like some like superman out into um no he uses two guardrails one guardrail and then a space between the guardrail and then the fans so and um Kiyomiya was in between the two guardrails and Monte jumps out over and onto him between those two guardrails it was timed perfectly it was measured perfectly it was great. And that match just went from there with uh, Kiyomiya and Monte wrestling a Kings Road strong style mix of a match. Just told a great story of, of an uprising Monte of Dragon Gate trying to take down the champion of Noah, right? This was Dragon Gate versus Pro Wrestling Noah. I don't watch Dragon Gate. I have nothing against it. I've never, I've never seen it. I've seen clips and stuff, and I, I remember when some of those guys used to come over to, and work with Gabe Sapolsky and stuff like that. I, I, I've seen stuff like that, but I've seen them. I, I know of the company. I'm not ignorant to it completely, but I, I've never watched one of their shows, ever, not one. And I don't say that in any negative form. I'm just telling the truth. Uh, but that's what this battle was, and that was the story that was being told. And unfortunately, Dragon Gate wins, and Monte defeats Kiyomiya. And a huge upset. But look, Kiyomiya was upset last year in the very opening round. I think it was the first match of this show. And why do I feel like I missed a match here? Um, didn't Jack Morris wrestle on this? Um, just bruising his... Yes, I missed a match. Forgive me, guys. We'll go back to it. But the main event of this... Kiyomiya goes down to Luis Monte. It's a huge story of Dragon Gate wrestler defeating him. Jumping back real quick to the match I missed. Two of my favorites. I, again, guys, I'm super hyped about coming back here and I'm messing up. Please forgive me. Please keep coming back. But Masa Kitamiya took on Jack Morris. This is one of my favorite matches of the show. It's 15 minutes long because I love both of these guys. Jack Morris is a modern day Al Perez, Rick Rude, Bret Hart rolled into one. That's a hell of a compliment, right? Al Perez, Rick Rude, Bret Hart. His look, his style, his performance, his attitude, everything about him is those guys. He's got the, the attitude of a Rick Rude and, an, and a swagger of an Al Perez and the wrestling ability of Bret Hart. Is he as good as Bret Hart is? Not yet. I mean, the, the kid's still growing. He hasn't been around a real long time. I mean, he's not a rookie, but he hasn't been around 10, 15, 20 years. When he is, he's going to be as good as Bret Hart. Um, you've heard it from me first. But again, his swagger, his appearance, everything shouts. And you, This is the kind of guy you'd see walking down the street and suspect he was a professional wrestler. And if he wasn't, you'd be kind of shy. Oh, you're not. I'm not for sure you'd be a pro wrestler. Masakitamiya is the definition of Puresso to me. Are there guys better than him? Yes, that's not what I mean. He looks like a Japanese professional wrestler. The blonde, spiky hair, the barrel chest, the, just the, the look that he could eat you and, and pick his teeth with your bones. That Masa Kitamiya is the man. And watching him and Jack Morris square off was magic. Both of them 
had one win against each other. This was their rubber match. And my God, if Kitamiya didn't beat Jack Morris, the former national heavyweight champion, the former heavyweight tag team champion. Jack Morris is incredibly decorated. Kitamiya has multiple tag team runs. But man, I've been waiting for a Masa Kitamiya singles run for a long time. And this could be the sign of the beginning of it. Him overcoming Jack Morris, one of the most talented guy genes they've got over there, for sure is a huge sign to me. Took him out, just overpowered him, took all of Morris's offense and kept going until he landed that senton off the top rope onto Morris for the one, two, three, and the big win for Massa Kitamiya. Again, I apologize for having to jump back to the middle of the card, uh, having missed that match in my notes here. I'm just excited to be back. I'm Adam Lavelle. WrestlingDoneRight.com. I'll give you the links to all my socials. Please, please come follow me if you like Noah. Facebook. TikTok right now, I, it, it's all WWE, but I'm done with WWE. I ventured over there thinking Triple H would change things, and he did, but not enough. Not enough. I don't need any sports entertainment. I need pro wrestling, and that's what Noah is. Pro wrestling done right, baby. I'll be back again with more Noah soon because I'm going to try to watch these shows in as quick as I can so I can try to catch up again. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for your support. I appreciate it more than you know. I really do. See you soon.